everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Rebecca Taffel. I am the Director of Programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here for the Struggle to Close Attica Voices from the March for Justice. This program is the first of three this spring that the Foundation is producing as part of its series, States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color. You can see all of our previous programs online at the Sackler Center's website, uh, which for videos is www.brooklynmuseum.org slash E-A-S-C-F-A slash video. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I hope you'll come uh, back here in April on the 29th for the next program in our series, which will be hosted by Dara Lind. She is a senior reporter at Vox, and she'll be moderating a discussion investigating the intersection of immigration, ICE, sanctuary cities, and mass incarceration. And our final program this spring will be on May 20th, so please join us. Elizabeth Sackler, who is normally here to introduce and welcome everyone, was unable to be here today, um, but she left me with a few words that she'd asked me to share with all of you. Good afternoon to all. I'm sorry I'm unable to be with you today. Sophia, Elijah, and I have shared a passion for justice and the desire to dissemble an unjust penal system that systematically destroys lives and whole communities. This is the final season of States of Denial, the illegal incarceration of women, children, and people of color that my foundation has produced for the past four years at the Sackler Center. I'm grateful to the Novo Foundation for its support for this series over the past year. Last year, in the era of Trump, the Novo Foundation has initiated its Radical Hope Initiative. I urge you to check it out. It's fitting for the first of our last spring series to be moderated by Sophia. We are colleagues, friends, and sisters in arms. Sophia has more energy to take on the world than anyone else I know, and with more energy to spare, as you all shall see and hear in this program today. You will hear the extraordinary feat of one woman's vision to not only speak truth to power, but through her organization, the Alliance of Families for Justice, which is a mere two years old, to galvanize hundreds to march for 19 days from Harlem to Albany to protest and demand an end to the human rights abuses in prisons in New York State, indeed, across the country. Sophia, I'm sorry I'm not able to be present with you today on this stage, which we have shared on so many occasions. I thank you for all you do, all you stand for, and the ways in which you support and assist families of the incarcerated and their loved ones. You give hope to those who are without power or voice that they may gain a reprieve from the human rights abuses that they endure. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you to the panelists who share their stories today. And thank you to all of you, our audiences, who care, who share the struggle, and walk the talk of justice, equality, and equity. Stand strong, Elizabeth Sackler. So before we begin, I'm just going to share a little bit more about Sophia and the Alliance of Families for Justice. Sophia, as we have heard, is the founder of the Alliance of Families for Justice and its executive director. AFJ's mission is to support families of incarcerated people and people with criminal records, empower them as advocates, and enable them to marshal their voting power to achieve systemic change. Prior to founding AFJ, Sophia Elijah was the executive director of the Correctional Association of New York where she was the first woman and the first person of color to lead the 170-year-old organization. Ms. Elijah has dedicated her life to human rights and social activism and is a frequent presenter at national and international forums on criminal justice policy and human rights abuses. An accomplished advocate, attorney, scholar, and educator, Ms. Elijah has practiced criminal and family law for more than 30 years. She has served as deputy director and clinical instructor at the Criminal Justice Institute at Harvard Law School, has been a member of the faculty and the director of the Defender Clinic at CUNY School of Law, worked as a supervising attorney at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem, and also as an attorney at the Juvenile Rights Division of Legal Aid Society. So thank you, Sophia, for being here, and I will invite you up now to begin our panel. Thank you. Well, 
Good afternoon, everyone. I must admit, it feels a little strange to be here without Elizabeth, because um, we've done several of these programs together, but I know she's with us in spirit. Um, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon, and I particularly want to thank our panelists. They're going to tell you a little bit later on about their experiences with the March for Justice and with the Alliance of Families for Justice. But to kind of set the tone for the program, we wanted to show you a short video about the march that kind of puts into context um, the work that we're doing, the reason that we marched, and what we have in mind for the future. So I think there's um, somebody who's much better at tech than I am who's going to turn this image into a video for us to watch. And then we'll have our panel discussion. Thank you. In September of 1971, the men in Attica had an uprising to protest the inhumane conditions under which they were being held. Many of the conditions that are exactly the same as they are today. And they took over the yard and they created their own organizational structure. And they had a set of demands to bring about change and to end the inhumanity they were subjected to. And at a certain point, they asked to meet with the governor, then Governor Nelson Rockefeller and he refused to meet with them. Instead, he ordered the New York State troopers to retake the prison by force. They came with assault weapons. They scaled the top of the walls all around Attica. They fired tear gas into the yard, and they fired thousands and thousands of rounds of assault bullets and murdered 42 people including 10 hostages. And to this moment, the state of New York has not apologized to any of the family members of those people who were killed by the state. Where should we start? The Alliance of Families for Justice is a statewide organization. So we are very interested in building networks with other organizations and individuals all over the state. And so this March for Justice was designed to culminate in a rally on September 13th, the 46th anniversary of the Attica Massacre, to draw attention to what happened and to say we will never forget. And we are calling for the shutdown of Attica. And we are calling for the end of all human rights violations in prisons and jails across this state. What we should be looking at is should anyone with a mental health diagnosis be put in a cage? Should anybody who's pregnant be put in a cage? Should any child be put in a cage? Should any human being be put in a cage? We have more advocacy for four-legged animals than we do for two-legged people. People will beat you out of your mind for what you do to their dog and ignore what you do to another human being. So it's not about the laws, it's about the hearts. It's about the conscience, it's about our willingness to treat everybody with respect and dignity. And unless and until we get to that, we're not gonna fix this problem. Why don't we let people who are incarcerated have access to the internet? What are we afraid they might see? They might learn something, like their rights. Go visit. There is no substitute for walking through those doors, filling out those forms, talking to Officer Asshole, having to walk through the metal detector. Ladies, if you have on a underwire bra being told you have to take it off and go into that visiting room, brawlers. Sit in that visiting room. Watch people try to piece together their relationships and being humiliated. And once we do that, we will challenge every inhumane practice that exists. We have to. 
Because otherwise, we can never look at our children and grandchildren with any kind of pride. We owe it to them to build a humane society. We cannot ignore, we cannot ignore what's happening. So we tell them. So we tell them. Tell we em. are a family. We are a family. A mighty, mighty family. A mighty, mighty family. A united family. A united family. A diverse family. A diverse family. March into Albany. March into Albany. Fighting for justice. Fighting. Welcome, Kevin Barron, Carol Harriet, and Lily Osetutu. Is everybody ready? Hi, Hi everyone. Are we good? Okay. Hello. All right. So let's just jump right in the short video we saw some of you okay. I think we saw all of you and I would ask you to begin by telling the audience why you marched and I'll, I'll start with you Kevin well I marched because <clears throat> there was a need to spread awareness about some of the conditions that are going on inside the prisons. There was a need to make people aware of the suffering of families. Uh, a lot of times the families are ignored in these situations. And we just needed to uh, bring attention to some of the abuses that are going on. And we wanted to march along this route, a route that a lot of families take to visit some of, some of their loved ones inside. And so uh, for me, it was just uh, creating a situation of awareness. And once we're aware, then we can start taking some action to remedy some of the problems we have. And thank you, Kevin. And Carol, for you, why, why did you march? I marched basically because of my son. My, I didn't know much about uh, Alliance of Family for Justice. I didn't know much about the uh, organization as yet, because I've just, just, it's just started. And when they talking about marching to Albany, I thought it was crazy. But basically, I did it for my son. So, you know, but when I got, when I went on the march, I realized it's more than my son. It's, uh, it's a universal thing with all family members. So basically I started out for my son, but then I realized it's more than my son. Thank you, Carol. And for you, Lily. Um, so similar to Carol, when I first heard about marching, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> Sophia had put forth the idea of marching from Harlem to Albany. And being from London, I just knew that that was far away. I knew they were just far away. And as we explored the notion, the term putting your feet to the street, I think, you use quite often. And that really resonated with me. Because I know that for me, I wanted to march for everybody else that couldn't march alongside us. But I didn't know how best to do that. I know about my role in AFJ and how I contribute in that way, but I really wanted to be at the front lines. I wanted people to see me in action doing something. So I stood up and I agreed to the madness because I thought, in all honesty, I have to do this for everybody else that would love to be as crazy as me and do it. Okay, well now all of you have declared to the audience that I'm crazy. <laughs> um, that's, that's true. Thank that's you true. for that. Um, um, but, you, but you still marched. Yeah. So since you thought there was a wacky idea initially. If you would describe um, what was a typical day like? And I guess I will, I'll start with you, Lily, this time. Well, at the beginning, midway, because it changed. I think it changed, okay. it evolved. Um, so initially, we obviously had hundreds of people marching with us from Harlem to the Bronx. So in the beginning, that, I would say that was quite hectic. Um, that day felt like it felt like it was gonna be an interesting start, but it was in no way preparing me for what the rest of the march would be like. As we continued, we would start to implement and incorporate new ways of bonding the group. And that would be welcoming in new people, and in some ways saying, you know, clapping out and saying goodbye to the people that had marched with us previously. But it started off with us waking up extremely tired, your legs are sore, your feet ache, um, but finding the strength amongst our group to just keep going. 
Sophia, you introduced us doing some stretches, which was very helpful. Um, it helped you to feel a bit more limber to prepare you for the day. But more than anything, I felt like it centered me. It, I found a way to ground myself and prepare myself for the task ahead. Because it's no easy fate to march God knows how many miles a day. So a typical day started off with us doing some stretches and Kevin and I being like, why, why are we doing this again? <laughs> And, and Kevin, so how did our day kind of flow and end? I <coughs> also wanted to add that um, logistically, you know, we had to uh, pack up all our things, uh, the, the beds we, the beautiful, lovely beds we had. <laughs> that, um, you know, that we slept on the night before. And just the, the organizing effort, I think, was really amazing that, um, Sophia and Lily put together the logistics of this. Um, these things you take for granted were just, I mean, well taken care of. And just the idea of packing up everything and getting everybody on board, you know, everybody wakes up differently, <laughs> you know, and organizing bathroom time. There was one time in, in Yonkers, I mean, it was packed. I mean, we had about, what, 50 people in, in, in a very small area. So we had to organize bathroom time and how we would get out on time to go to our next destination. So those are things you kind of take for granted, but um, somehow we, we made it happen and uh, we got through personality differences and all of that to, to look at the big picture of what this was all about and to keep people focused on you know, what, why we were doing this to begin with. Thank you. And, and what did we do each, each evening besides our dinner? Yes. Well, the great part about um, the entire march of 19 days, I think almost every day we had teachings or rallies or, or seminars where whatever area we were in, we would have a, a somewhat of a workshop and just inform people of the issues, the general issues, the issues that might be in those particular areas. And it was a great turnout. It was a way for us to connect with the community and other organizations that we're gonna talk about later that uh, we network with. So in each and every one of those 19 days, we were able to tell people in those particular areas exactly what's going on. And a lot of people were shocked to hear you know, the things that are going on inside. So um, I enjoyed the teachings very much. And what kind of reception did you experience and balance that against what kind of reception you thought you were going to experience along the way? I'll ask. Um, I'll start with Carol and then Lily. Why not? <laughs> this is the way it was for 19 days, by the way. Okay. Well, when I when we when when they talk about the march and I talk about where we're going to be, you know, up north in the basically I call it I call it a. Uh, the boondocks, <laughs> basically up there. And uh, I'm thinking that these people are not going to be receptive to us. They're going to be like, what is these people doing in our backyard? They're probably going to shoot us, hang us. I'm sorry, guys. I'm being really honest. That was my thought, because we do not know where, what we're going into. What are we getting ourselves into? So I was scared. I didn't tell them, though, because I'm one of the brave ones. So I didn't say anything. But I was literally scared. But we had got a little problem when I was on the march, because I didn't march all 19 days, but when, one of the time when I got on the march, we was kicked out of a park by the fire department. They said, get out of the park, we don't want you in here. And it was very uh, aggressive. That scared me. But most of the time, we had really nice people who, like she said, fed us. They fed us like we gained weight. So we lost weight, we gained weight. So we had more nice than bad. So that overrides, you know, what I expected. So basically, it was an experience that I was scared going in, and I was scared for a minute with those people in the park, with the fire department, but we also had some very nice people, you know, which surprised me, because the way, the, from the treatment that I get when I go to the facilities, it's basically mostly white guards that's there, so I get very bad treatments. So when I was going up there, I expected the same treatment from the same, because you know, white people, you understand? I expect the same treatment the way I get from there. So it was very refreshing to find that there was really, really nice people. Lily, you want to add to that? 
So I think I was somewhat apprehensive um, moving forward. I, I didn't know exactly what to expect, but I do know that in this day and age and in the political climate that we sit in at the moment, there isn't room for people to kind of sit on the fence right now. People have a view, they have an opinion, and they're quite open about expressing those views and opinions, and sometimes they don't necessarily match your own. So I have taken many a visit upstate, and as I have gone upstate, I've seen that a lot of people are fans of Trump. I personally am not, but you know, their views differ to mine. And so those kind of things being in the back of your mind made me a bit wary of what to expect. I would say though, honestly, like Carol said, it, it, it shattered my expectation because we were met with so much love, so much love. There were times when, you know, people would come out to meet us in droves or to just generally come and see if we needed some water. That's when I really felt the humanity and the spirit of people coming together. And I knew that even though you could differ in terms of opinions, it wasn't necessarily going to cause a problem. That's not to say we didn't encounter some people who did have a problem with what we were doing, even though they didn't know what we were necessarily doing. <laughs> so there was an occasion where we marched through the town of, is it Buchanan? Yeah. Right. So we were marching, doing our usual chants. You know, we are a family, a happy, happy family, singing things that I think are quite uplifting. Um, as we were walking through this small town of Buchanan, a guy comes out on his porch or something and he starts shouting, I don't know what he's shouting because we're also shouting, so there's a bit of a clash. Um, we're chanting, not shouting. And he then proceeds to do some sort of, I'm, I'm thinking he jumps up and down and does some sort of a movement. Um, and then says, hold on one moment, I've got something for all of you. He ran into his back garden, which is out of sight. So at this point, some of us are thinking he's going to get a knife, a gun, you don't know what he's doing. We're in a small town upstate and they're not happy to see us. He then runs back outside. Okay, that's giving him too much credit. Credit. He kind of waddles back outside because he was a heavier set guy and eventually gets back to the sidewalk and he has a hose in his hand. And he then begins to start to spray the hose towards us. Now, I didn't live through the civil rights movement, but I can imagine that that probably hits home for quite a few people that did. And that's when I thought to myself, wow, wow, wow. As much love as you can be met with, when people meet you with that same passion and it channels into hatred, that is scary. Hatred for something that they don't know or understand. Because we were chanting about things that were, what I believe, should bring people together. Like you mentioned in the video, you know, we have more compassion for four-legged animals than two-legged people. And some of the things that we were marching about was for the human rights abuses that are taking place against people. They don't think and this guy just saw a mixed group of people, I will say, a diverse group, mm -hmm. because as we went further and further upstate, we actually had more diversity in terms of our group. Mm -hmm. And he just wasn't happy. And that, that, for me, I think, hit home. It didn't overshadow all of the good we were met with, but it definitely stuck with me. Yeah. And it reminded me that the fight continues. So I remember in that moment, it's like we had this this thing, this energy between us, we all started chanting louder and our feet started hitting the street harder. And there was something about us that, find that found the strength. So I wanna thank him for trying to hose us down. <laughs> you know, it was cool to do it at the time to give us that strength, but it was, a, it was a reminder to say the least of what we were doing and the task we were taking on. Thank you, yes, I, I remember that guy with the, the hose. Mm -hmm. And I actually thought he'd gone to get a gun. Right. And, um, and in that moment, um, we were uh, being followed. We, we had a little caravan that was following us, a small school bus, a truck with all of our supplies, and a volunteer who was driving a Jeep. All three of the drivers were Vietnam veterans, and they were all at the ready to go into action if we were in danger in that moment. But we didn't know that they were planning some kind of I don't know, military action, I guess, over there. Um, but it, it was quite a moment out there in that, in that small town. Um, I want to sh uh, shift the conversation a little bit um, because you all have shared um, why you marched. Um, but I'd like if you could share kind of like what kind of preparation did you go through to get ready for this event? And I'll, I'll, other than deciding that I was crazy, I'll start with you, Kevin. <laughs> Months and months of walking. 
And because physically, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it physically. You know, my heart was in the right place, but I wasn't sure <laughs> if my feet was going to follow my heart. <laughs> so uh, I did a lot of walking, and then I was ready. I was motivated. Once we got started, you know, that was it. There was no turning back. But also uh, mentally, you know, uh, just being prepared, and we, uh, we encountered media along the way, so I wanted to be prepared and, and to, to present our case in you know articulate manner so people understand exactly what's going on and what we're, what we're doing, and to prepare for resistance. So all of that stuff was kind of going through my mind. I had no idea what it was going to be like, so, but it, it was a great challenge. Uh, I really enjoyed it, actually. Carol, how about for you? Because you ended up doing extra duty during the march. What kind of preparation did you do? I didn't do any preparation, people. I was lazy. <laughs> I did not want to go. I'm not lying, but I had to go. I have a bad knee, and I'm saying, Carol, what in God's name are you doing? But it was so important. This march was so important. So eye-opening. So I didn't really did any kind of exercise. Like I said, I'm lazy. I didn't run, I didn't walk. Sofa keep telling me, Cal, you gotta walk a couple of days before you start. I say, yeah, 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 I'm doing, I'm doing, but I lied, I'm sorry, God. <laughs> I didn't, and let me tell you something, my knees felt every pain. Sophia, my knees felt every pain. That's because you didn't practice, you didn't I, warm up. <laughs> I didn't listen to mama, and I'm sorry, but I didn't feel pain, so I really didn't prepare anything, but mom, with, uh, my mind, I pray a lot, so that helped me to meet people, see people, and talk to people. We also had some forum that Sophia did before we leave, where we do media, or to talk to media people, how to talk to people without, you know, if they push your button, how to keep calm, because people do push your button. So, you know, we had a little program about that, which was very helpful, you know, so, beside that, that was it. Lily, did you prepare? I mean, I'm gonna follow on from Carol. I, I didn't prepare. I go to the gym, so I thought, I've got this, I'm fine, I'll be fine. After day one, I was like, my legs, my legs, <laughs> I can't feel my legs. But in terms of like the physical way of preparing, I was like, I'll take it each day as it comes. But I think a lot of that happened because the logistical team, there were a lot of us in the office trying to make all of these moving parts come together and it was not easy. And that's why I want to give a shout out to Tiffany, Maya, <laughs> Izzy, Sophia, Linda, and everybody else that helped to make it come together. Roberta set up our whole Roberta, system. Roberta, Roberta, Roberta you. raise your hand. Yeah, thank okay. you. Like, there was so much that had to go into it and that meant for a lot of people, not myself, early mornings, but more so for me, late nights. And so, in terms of preparing for the march, I feel like I was so buried into trying to take this march off of paper and make it come to fruition. So that was my preparation. Just mentally always trying to envision where we're gonna be and how it's gonna look. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Kevin, you wanna add something? I just wanna add one part that uh, also I needed to prepare in terms of um, photography and videography, which was kind of um, <clears throat> thrown upon me to uh, document what was going on. So I wanted to be prepared that everything was, was properly documented. I've done still photography for years, but I've never really did any videography. So some of the videos weren't all that great, but some of it was, was uh, served the purpose of documenting what we, what we were doing. And um, I would like if each of you would share one particular highlight um, during the march, and then I'm going to shift again. But if there was one highlight during the during the march, and before you answer that question, I do want to give particular thanks to the various um, faith-based organizations that housed us over the course of the 19 days. We stayed in various churches um, along the way, none of whom had we had any relationship or contact with before we kind of reached out and say, hey, you don't know us, but can we sleep on the floor in, in your church? We did have air mattresses, so those, it wasn't quite as bad as the sleeping bags we had originally planned on. Um, but I definitely wanted to say thank you to all of the religious leaders, not only who housed us, many of them, after housing us that evening, came back the next morning and marched with us, even though that hadn't been their original plan. 
So I'll start with, I guess, Lily. What's a highlight that you um, took away from that 19 days? Sophia, I know this might sound a little bit blah, but the thing that sticks out the most to me is the laughter. Mm -hmm. Because through it all, no matter what we were going through and the difficult times and the struggles and how exhausted we were, I'm going to say you, me and Kev, because we done the whole thing. We always found time to laugh. Whether we were sitting around dinner and, you know, as part of the logistical team, I'm exhausted at this point because I've been in go mode from beginning to the end of the day. I always found some sort of way to laugh with you. And I want to thank you both for that because it kept me going. That was a highlight. But if I think about an area that we stopped off, Newburgh. That's, that stood out for me. Okay. What, and what about Newburgh stood out? They, they cooked us a lot of food. <laughs> a lot of food. Not that we needed any more food, because we needed a lot, but I will always say yes to another plate. They went, they went absolutely all out for us. We arrived, and they had put on the most amazing spread. When we arrived at their first church, mm -hmm. we had eaten a buffet-style meal. Then they took us over to their second church, which couldn't have been any more than, what, 15 minutes away? Right. And we had another meal where everybody had cooked and brought food from home. And I was happy for Sophia because she's vegan. And these are SDA, so Seventh Day Adventists. So they are vegan. So the spread was incredible. But they also had a revival afterwards, which I've never been to. That was incredible to see. I, I really appreciated Newburgh. But something that touched me about Newburgh as well is how heavily impacted the community was. Sophia done um, a talk there after we'd eaten our second meal. And she, she asked people to put up their hands if they had a loved one or had been impacted by mass incarceration in any way. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, a good few people raised their hands. And there were so many people within that congregation that didn't know somebody else had been impacted. For them, that was the first time that they had shared that they had a loved one that was incarcerated. And that really hit home because it goes back to the idea of isolation. And the fact that there have been studies conducted by Hedwig Lee, and you know they touch on the fact that family members who have someone who is incarcerated are the least civically engaged. And for us, that was something we needed to, we wanted to eradicate that. And we'll talk a bit more about the ways that we're doing that later on, but that's why Newburgh stood out for me. There were so many things in that one moment, that one night, yeah. Thank you. And, and Carol, for you, what was the highlight for you? When I reach out on the march, yeah, whichever. I mean, when I reach her on the march, well, I like uh, Pastor, was Pastor Mike? What's his name, Pastor? Oh, Pastor D. Pastor D. Yeah. We stopped at his church. Mm -hmm. I find it, it, it was very refreshing for me because I realized diverse people can work together. We're diverse, but we can work together. Mm -hmm. And it was so refreshing to see majority of the people that was up there was not of my color, but they was willing to work with us. I like. Lily said the food was awesome. Always food. How can you go to walk for 19 days of gateway? I don't understand, but there was always food. And the people, Pastor D was so nice. His congregation was very nice. So that was one of my highlights. But I have a few, but I'll wait till later. And, and Kev, what was the highlight for you? I think uh, there were a lot in between, but the, the kickoff and the ending were both the highlights for me. The kickoff was tremendous. I mean, we had, you know, probably three, 400 people there. Um, Danny Glover, I got a chance to meet Danny Glover. And, um, you know, some of our people spoke. Um, Jamal Joseph was there. And it was just a tremendous, tremendous kickoff in Harlem. And then our elders uh, leading the way for blocks and blocks and blocks was, was just, you guys raise your hand. Barbara. 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 <laughs> They don't hear us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was tremendous. It was really inspirational to have them leading the way, and you just see a whole group of people behind them uh, crossing the bridge into, into the Bronx. That was really uh, inspirational for me. And then the ending, you know, we did it. You know, we came near the end. We set out to do something, and we accomplished what we set out to do. So that was, uh, those were the highlights for me. You know, I, I wasn't going to answer the question myself, but I think I want to share one highlight. There were, and I, like you all said, there were many. But we went to Garrison, and we stopped there for lunch at a convent. And the nuns prepared our lunch. 
And they were all in non attire, I guess it's the best way to describe it. They had their habits and their, they had the floppy habit. Mm -hmm. So then they were like bustling all around, waiting on us. Now, I don't know how many of you in the audience have ever had a bunch of nuns waiting on you. I would venture to say probably you haven't had that experience. So that in and of itself stood out. But then we were finished, and they, they really didn't want us to leave. And they were already talking about us coming back and marching next year. And it was kind of early in the march to be talking about us trying to do it again. Um, but what really struck me was at the end, we're all saying our goodbyes, and our groups lined up now to start chanting and marching to go to the next space. And there, the nuns are lined up behind us. And they're waving to us, but the next thing I know, they're marching with us. They just, start, they just fell into formation and marched with us down till we got to the main thoroughfare. And that, that scene really stood out to me because it spoke to how people just um, embraced what we stood for. Even if they didn't understand why we would choose to march as opposed to another way to make a point, they really respected the fact that we were willing to put in that much effort, that it was that important to us that we would take 19 days out of our lives and we would literally put our feet <coughs> on the ground uh, to draw attention to it. Um, so before I ask the next question, I want to um, shout out a couple of people in the audience. First, I want to shout out Jane, who will raise her hand, I hope. Thank you. Who came to an event that we had last year at the Sackler Center. And Jane and I hadn't seen each other in a few years. And afterwards, she came up to me. She said, I really like what you're doing. I want to get involved. And she volunteered to get the parade and sound permits for all of the towns and villages that we marched through, which was a tedious job. People weren't always happy to hear that she was getting permits for us to come, those New York City people to come walking through their peaceful towns. But she took that on, so I want to give her a shout out for that. And, we and then I want to give a shout out to her husband, Mark, who was pressed into services for doing photography for us. <laughs> have one of our um, upstate partners, um, Phoebe, who's here from Ithaca. Yeah. And I think I saw Cadell. Did I see? Yeah, there she is, from the Unitarian Church of All Souls that hosted oh. one of our um, events <laughs> last year. And then I, I definitely have to acknowledge Emily, who's back there with the knitting needles, <laughs> who's done all of our grant writing as a volunteer for a full year before she came on board just a month ago as a paid employee. So let's wow. and I can't leave out two of our three fearless elders who led the march. Those of you who got to see the video saw Miss Barbara and Miss Beverly. And then there was Miss Ivan, okay? In their 80s, who led the march. And as Kevin mentioned, they were supposed to only walk for a couple of blocks. And then the game plan was they were supposed to get into the school bus, all right? And then the rest of us were going to walk. But they, you know, we were going to, in a respectful of elderly way, they were going to ride while we marched. Okay. <laughs> And they wouldn't get on the bus. Okay. <laughs> they kept marching and marching and marching. And we had a police escort from Harlem to the Bronx. And the, those, those cops actually, whenever they were thinking about us, they were totally swept away by these three elders who wouldn't sit down on the bus. And finally, one of the cops said, ma'am, you've got to please get on the bus. We're, we're out of our jurisdiction, but we can't leave you. And so finally, reluctantly, after crossing the bridge into the Bronx, they got on the bus. So I think they deserve some applause. I'm conscious of the time, so I want to shift the conversation 
Um, we've talked a bit about this march, um, the, the takeaways from it. I think we're also clear. I don't think I could convince you all to march next year. No, okay. That's good, we have a solution for that. Okay. Okay. So what are the future plans? What are the, what are the things that we have in the works going forward? And I think I'll start with uh, Kevin. Well, it's always good to follow up on marches. You know, a lot of groups have a lot of marches and then that's, that's it. But um, we plan on, uh, we're gonna have some regional conferences coming up. The first one is gonna be uh, in New York City in April, April 13th and 14th uh, in Manhattan. And what we plan to do there is to raise some issues and uh, consolidate some of the, the, the networking partners that we've, uh, we've been in touch with and just talk about some issues that are affecting the community and come up with some strategies and some action plans as to uh, you know, what to do next, some, some practical stuff to make, you know, to follow up on the momentum that we created for the march. So um, we have six regional conferences uh, planned, three for this year and three for next year. And some of them will be in, uh, in Ithaca and in Adirondacks, Adirondacks and Buffalo and Albany. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna start in, in April. Uh, as I said, it's gonna be here in New York City. Then we're going to Peekskill in July and Ithaca in October. And then the following year we'll be in Buffalo on, in April and Albany in June and the Adirondacks in May. So we wanna follow up, as I said, um, what we created on the march. We created some, some dynamic partnerships and we're gonna come up with some action plans to really make a difference and to put pressure on people. You know, uh, there are people in power that we need to uh, give them a little shove and we have uh, some power of our own that we need to start exercising. So we're looking forward to that. We're also gonna have a family retreat coming up at the end of uh, June, beginning of July. And we're looking forward to that, to some relaxation and some recreation, but also to again, uh, create a safe space where we could talk about some issues uh, regarding families. So uh, those are two things we got uh, coming up okay. in the future. Thank you. Um did you want anything you would like to add, particularly about the regional conference, or about anything else we're going to be doing? Okay, so um, Kevin spoke a bit about the regional conferences, and we do have some palm cards at the back if you want to grab them. It's got a bit of info about what we're doing, the dates we're doing it, and we've got some really key speakers that will be present as well, so I think it's not to be missed. I'm really excited. Um, we've got some key keynote speakers as well that I think you should come along to. But just following on from what Kevin said, this is a great way for us to have this conversation around why we marched, what we're doing, and how we're gonna do it. And in AFJ, we've been sort of in our little hub having a lot of conversations like this. So the regional conferences for me really stand out for that reason. I wanna thank the Unitarian Church because they're gonna be hosting us. <laughs> and for those of you who are involved um, or can come to learn about AFJ, Everything that we do for our family members is free. We've not charged anybody for anything. We took a bus of family members up to caucus weekend so that they could make the issues known as far as how families are impacted by mass incarceration and no one had to pay a dime. When we did the March for Justice, all the food, everything was free. Every single event, we do a mother's acknowledgement event in May, a father's acknowledgement in June. We had a, a, a family dinner gathering in November. Um, no one ever has to pay anything, and that's because we don't ever want economics to be a barrier for people getting involved. We live in a society that's driven by money, and this is our small way of making it clear that money should never be the separator of people. Mm -hmm. Carol frequently will tell me that, you know, you should ask people to give a little something. And, and if people want and can, that's fine. Donate but, people, donate. Okay. <laughs> but if they can't, they should still be able to come and, and get involved, and that's what's really in, important to us. Um, we have been building a, a statewide network of other organizations that share in our beliefs and our concerns that families are really the, um, being shredded 
by mass incarceration. In this state, there's a little under 50,000 people who are currently incarcerated and another 36,000 people who are on parole or probation supervision. So all of those families are impacted by mass incarceration and the focus of the regional conferences is going to be how families are impacted and how we can do something to rebuild those families and push back against um, the devastation that is being visited on those communities where the families come from. So I hope that all of you will come. As Lily mentioned, we have these palm cards and one of the ways, people always ask us how can they help? What an easy way that people can help is you can take a bunch of these, they're in the back, and give them to other people. Another easy way you can help is to go on our website, sign up to get our newsletter and urge other people to do so. Carol said, and it's true, None of the, none of the, we don't charge people for anything, but we have to pay for everything we do. So we raise the money through foundation support and individual donations, so certainly f donations are always helpful. But spreading the word is perhaps the most impactful thing that you can do. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are on social media, so we'll ask you, is it up there? It's not up there, but it's on all of our materials, our various social media handles. Now, I'm tech challenged, so I'm gonna use the wrong technology. Um, but those of you who are on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, please um, follow us, post, tweet, whatever those words are that I'm supposed to say at this moment. <laughs> Do those things, okay? Okay, I'm going to now shift. I want to talk a little bit about some of the advocacy that we've been engaged in, and then I want to open up the floor for questions, okay? So I'll start with... Um, Carol just voluntold Kevin. That's a new word for, for AFJ, by the way. Voluntold. Okay. You don't volunteer for anything in this place. We're just told what to do by <laughs> Sophia. But, you, but you're supposed to feel like you're a volunteer, so it's voluntold. So we'll start with Kevin. What are some of the advocacy endeavors that we've taken on in the past year since you've been involved with AFJ? Whew, so many issues going on. but. Um I particularly was excited about the, the caucus weekend that we went on, where we were able to go up to Albany and um, let the legislators know some of the issues that are on our heart, and we were able to uh, have scheduled meetings and then sit down with them for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, and give out, uh, also give out our postcards, and just let them know what's on our hearts and that we're gonna be following up, and we want to know, you know exactly where they were coming from. So there, you know, there's a lot of issues going on that um, we're probably gonna get into, but um, that weekend was really special. We also had a, a workshop, which I and myself, uh, my partner here, participated in, and you know, we discussed uh, how, how families are affected by everything that's going on. You know, as I said earlier, a lot of times, uh, we, we just talk about those inside, as we should, because there's a lot of injustices going on inside. But most times, families are left out. Nobody talks about the support of the families. And one of the reasons why I joined AFJ was because the emphasis on families being supported. And that, that's really critical. Uh, a lot of people don't realize the impact incarceration has on an entire family, emotionally, financially, you know. If you have children, you know, you know the, stigmat the stigmatism that goes along with that. So, um, went off a little bit, but that, that's some of the issues that, um, that uh, just come to mind right away. Kevin, I see you have that palm card on your lap. Could you show that to the audience, please? So those are in the back, and they are like a snapshot of the various ways that mass incarceration impacts families and communities. So if you feel that you want to start talking to other people about these issues, please grab some of those palm cards. You can give them out to other people, and they're easy talking points to help you to understand. If you haven't lived that experience, it may help you to be able to describe it to other people. And if you can kind of imagine putting yourself in the place of a mother or a spouse or a child who has an incarcerated loved one, um, this palm card was designed by one of our family members who's directly impacted. It will help you to start that conversation with other people who you think might give you a listening ear. Um, I'm then going to turn to Lily, because you have um, 
uh, postcards. Maybe you could tell people about that package um, policy that we worked on. With pleasure. So Volatile. Volatile, right? Yeah, so docs are very sneaky. I'm not sure how familiar all of us are with the way <coughs> they do things. We well, have to tell them what docs is. Oh, sorry. The Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. So they are the body that runs the facilities in New York State as well. So, so docs, as I was saying, very sneaky. Um, they tend to be doing a lot of things behind the scenes that a lot of people aren't aware of, namely family members. Recently, they tried to push through a policy, um, which we labeled the package policy, which would have made it so there are a lot of changes to what our loved ones can receive inside. The things like fresh fruit and vegetables, which we are told on a daily basis we need to eat, we need to consume these things. Docs were trying to rid our loved ones of being able to order these things or have access to them. Um, certain religious material, um, books, they would have had a say over the kind of books that would have come through. They would have had vendors which were out of state, basically benefiting from the revenue and just capitalizing off of essentially our misery and lack of funds. So once AFJ caught a whiff of this, of course we were not happy. Um, we decided, alongside a, a number of organizations, that we were going to push back against this DOCS policy. So this postcard you see me holding here was our way of pushing back. We would ask that family members or anybody we encountered could sign and put their zip code on there as a way to show that they stand in solidarity with us to say we're not going to allow this to take place. And that involved us doing one of the most important things we do in AFJ, which is the outreach. We go to these bus stops where loved ones are picked up and taken on these six hour journeys to go and see their loved one upstate somewhere. And we would stand there and have conversations with the different family members about what's happening. And a lot of them didn't have a clue. They had no idea. And in spreading the word, like Sophia said, it raised a lot of awareness. And the policy was rescinded. So we can half clap because, you know, we've done half a job, so half a clap, but stop, we have to stop. Because although it's been rescinded, DOCS always has another policy that they're trying to push through. So we have not stopped doing what we're doing. So I would ask that if anybody is here that feels passionate like we are about this, please grab a postcard, take a stack of them, and go and give them out to people, and have a conversation. And if you can get them to sign their name and their zip code on the back, and we've even paid for the postage, so all you have to do is pop it in the letterbox. Is that what you call it? Letterboxes. Mailbox. Mailbox. <laughs> mailbox. Letterbox is a, is a British thing, I think. Yeah. Mailbox. So just pop it in the mailbox. British, yeah. So yeah, that's one of the things that we're working on as well. Um, do you want me to talk about the rule? Okay, so... Can, can I just add one thing? Just as a result of, we sent 2,000 postcards, around 2,000 to, to the governor, that influenced him to rescind the policy. So this stuff works. Mm -hmm. this and part of the way that we were able to be effective is the partnerships that we have formed with organizations across the state. So when we decided we were going to engage in this postcard campaign, we mailed dozens and dozens of bundles of postcards to our various organizational partners that we met during the March for Justice. And they all got postcards signed. Now some of you might be saying, why didn't you just do a petition campaign? Wouldn't that be easier and cheaper? Well, we know that the governor's office counts pieces of mail. That really has a major impact on it. So one piece of mail is the equivalent of almost 25 signatures on a petition. And a postcard counts just like a letter. And so since we know they count them, we decided to send him thousands of them. Love letters, we call them. Right? And we're continuing this effort because no sooner did the governor announce that they were rescinding the package policy, docs announced that they were only temporarily suspending it. So we know that they're planning to come back with another policy. And in the interim, each of the 54 prisons is doing whatever they want to do with respect to packages, which is causing major confusion all over the state. So we hope that you will join with us and sign the postcards. If you don't want to find a mailbox, which is harder to find these days, we'll even put them in the mail for you. But the main thing is please don't take them and throw them out. If you take them, please get them signed. Um, because it's, yeah, we already have stamps on them. The last policy, and does any of you, are any of you able to talk about the visiting policy before we talk about rule review? 
All right, I'll talk about the visiting policy. Last year, Governor Cuomo announced that he was going to reduce in-person visiting at maximum security prisons from seven days a week to just three days a week, which was going to be catastrophic for a whole host of reasons. Okay? And it obviously was going to have a major impact on family ties. And so our members across the state engaged in a campaign letter writing, calling, putting pressure on the governor's office and saying, oh, no, 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 not on our watch. It's not going to happen. And in just a few weeks, they were um, effective and victorious and got the governor to rescind this idea of reducing visiting. So this is, these things are very important, not only because the policies need to be rescinded, but also it sends a strong message to our family members that when they take that pain that they feel from having a loved one incarcerated and they feel empowered by putting their efforts together, they really can make a difference. Yeah. And that, that will, is part of the reason that we believe that we can shut down Attica, yeah. because if we can, push back on a visiting policy and on a package policy, if we can galvanize more people, people who are directly impacted and people who care, just like at one point no one thought Rikers could be closed and now it's going to be closed, we can shut down Attica and we're going to shut down Attica. Yes. Okay. So I do want to have Lily talk about uh, an effort that we're engaged in right now about um, well, I won't describe it. Lily, please explain for the audience. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on it just because I know we're conscious of time. But it's okay. Um, okay, so one of our volunteers has received a request from her loved one who's locked up, and he asked us to take a look at what are some of the rules that will be reviewed. Um, as we explored this, we went away for a retreat like a couple of weekends ago and ourselves and the rest of our um, coalition decided to have a chat about some of these rules that will be reviewed. And it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. They are proposing the idea of removing law libraries. Law libraries are key for people who are incarcerated. Key. Because that essentially is the key to their freedom. There are many people who are considered jailhouse lawyers. Even lawyers who are on the outside respect their work and their efforts because they have a lot of time. And a lot of time means they have a lot of time to read and educate themselves. If you remove a law library, you are taking away people's freedom and their hope more than anything to ever think that they can bring themselves back home. The fact that they are talking about removing law libraries or eliminating things like contact visits, the, again, it blows my mind. So there's a suggestion in this rule review that initial contact visits will be removed. So if you have a husband, a son, a daughter, and they've been moved to another facility or have just gone in for the first time, you won't be able to touch them. You won't be able to, to kiss them. And these are the kind of ridiculous things that are being proposed. So. In AFJ, of course, we, we caught whiff of this and we're like, nope, not having it. So we have put together, or I should say Akira, thank you, shout out to Akira. She has put together a nice letter that says what we are opposing. And all we ask is that you take some of these letters with you. Do we have some at the back? Yes, a bunch of them. We've got some more of these letters at the back. And have a read. It just says all of the things that we're not happy with and we're not going to stand, like, agree with. And if you could, just sign your name at the back and put your zip code as well, like Miss Beverly's saying. Again, it's another way for us to push back. And they can leave those here. Right? <coughs> yeah, you can leave those here and we will take over from there. But I do ask that please, everybody here, if you could grab some of those, that would be amazing. Because one thing we did realize as well is they've already determined when they're going to review these rules. So is it every two years? Yes, every two years they're being reviewed and there's a deadline for this yes. letter of April the 1st. Yeah, April 1st. So we, we need to, one, almost be prophets and try and anticipate what they're going to try and take away or change in the future. But whilst we're here in the present, we need to push back. So I would ask that please, especially with the deadline approaching, you take, you sign, and you leave behind, and we will do the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. You know, question. The, the question. I'm Go sorry, ahead. question. I'm going to do what the audience will do. Do you need to put your address on it or just a zip no, code? Just a zip, zip code. code. And there's a reason why we say the zip code, because we, yeah. we need it to show that it's from across the state. You know, mm -hmm. If people can put their zip code, it doesn't look like it's just coming from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. We need to show that everybody across the state is, is aware of this. Right. 
And it's interesting, like, you know, as the world becomes more digitized and we use email for everything, we pay for bills online, right? Why would they require that the response to this particular rule review be by snail mail? Right? By snail mail. Like, how, I, I actually know people who have no idea how to write a check because every, they pay for everything online, okay? But be that as it may, we're flexible. So we adjust to whatever the demand is. So we have the letters printed. We had somebody go through with a fine tooth comb. Some of you might like to look at the, the litany of proposed rules uh, that are up for review. And we have copies of those in the back if you'd like to look at those. But we hope that everybody will sign this letter so that many voices are heard. Because what usually happens is that docs promulgates a bunch of rules and nobody ever responds. Okay, because they don't know, all right? We're fortunate that a guy inside had the time and the intellect, and he found the rule and got it out to his wife, and so we could go into action. And that's how we learn about a number of different policies, because the people inside are the true experts, okay? They're living and breathing it every day. And so our job is to support and do what we can do on the outside that they can't do on the inside. So hopefully all of you will take that letter. We have um, our next community organizing meeting. Is when, Carol? This is in the back also, and it's on, I don't know. April 26th from 6 to 8 at the National Black Theater, 2031 Fifth Avenue. And we have some in the back, right? Yeah, this flyer is So there's a flyer in the too. back, so please come out to the meeting. It's very important, because if I didn't come to that meeting, I don't know what I would do, I'd be lost. You understand, this meeting, this Alliance of Family for Justice has helped me tremendously. Not only I got someone to talk to, let my guards down, because when, when my son was, uh, I hate talking because then I talk about it, I get all cry, cry like a little baby, and I hate being like that. When my son got incarcerated, it was very hard for me. And if it was for these family, that gave me one of these flyers at a bus one night, I probably, would be so depressed. I don't know what would have happened. And the organization has helped me. That I know I'm volunteering for Alliance of Family for Justice. And believe me, people, it's so important because these family members, you don't know what they're going through. You do not know what they're going through. So it's very important. I'm so sorry. I get so emotional when I talk about this. I met last night, I was at the bus stop. I met mothers, wives. I went to see my son yesterday, uh, Friday. I met wise and the thing that they're going through with these, they're going through. It's so sad to see that we're in 2018 in New York City, America, land of free and justice, and these people are going through so much. There's a mother who got a letter from her son. Her son hasn't eaten food in three days because he's in the box. They choose to feed him if they want to, or they choose not to feed him if they want to. There's another mother whose son passed out, a wife. She drove from Florida. She lives in Florida. She drove down and she can only come up every six months. She's a school teacher. And she can come up when school gives recess. Her husband passed out because they forgot to order medicine for her husband. They know he needs this medicine. Okay? I'm talking to people and it's like, when I go to the bus stop and meet these people, I cannot get a, a good report. Oh, wow. Doc's been so great to me. I'm, oh, my son, they're fine. My daughter is great. I'm getting all these things. I, I cannot get that information from why? Why can't we just receive a good report from Doc's? Why are they so powerful? I don't understand. I'm sorry I keep doing this. I'm sorry, Sophia. It's okay. Why are they so powerful? I don't understand. Our children is suffering, and you guys, you know, it, it, you come to the meeting, you, you know, you do, you listen. But are you doing anything? Are you doing anything, guys? Because everybody in prison is not guilty. And you have watched how many of our brothers, our sisters walked out of jail because of not guilty, because of lack of funds, of lack of good uh, education, of not getting a good lawyer because they can't afford it, are sitting in jail and not, nothing is happening more than they are being abused. So I'm sorry if I took up too much time, but you guys, we have to do something. These people saved my life, like I said. I, I was so depressed, and when I got to met, 
uh, Sophia, she's one of you and uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry she's not here to meet you. I talk about them all the time. Some people don't like to say, I see two white people at the bus stop in the freezing degrees giving out these flyers, but there was two white people at the bus stop giving out these flyers, and it took my heart to see two white people at a bus stop at zero below two degrees on a winter night giving out this. So it really affected me to see, well, hey, it may be all white people ain't all that bad. You understand? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm being honest because the, the abuse that I get when I go to the facilities and what I'm hearing from my son, my son said, Mom, you know, sometimes the correction officer, they'll have a bad day. They can't beat their wife. They can't run nobody off the street that try to run them over. They can't, if they get a bad coffee, they can't throw back in the guy that gave them a bad coffee. So when they come inside and you say, good morning, officer, they say, what do you say about my mother? What do you say about my mother? And they're ready to beat you down. You understand? It, 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 it's, it's bad, it's very bad. The system is messed up. And Alliance of Family for Justice, God bless their heart, they're trying to fix it. And I'm behind them 100% and you guys better get behind them too. Because it's very important. Because everybody in jail is not a, a wicked, evil monster. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, April 26th. Well, let's, let's open it up for some questions. I'm, I'm sure that there's a few ideas of Simon's back there with the mic. Yeah. So, and you know, one of the beautiful things about the, the, our form of language is that questions end in question marks. <laughs> so if you want to give a speech, let's hold the speeches till later and, and get some questions out, because I'm sure that there's some things that you'd like to know. So who would like, who has a question? I know somebody does. Okay, first question. Um, you were talking, uh, you've been talking about closing Attic, and I was wondering, you've been talking about what you're doing in general, but what specific, how is the campaign to close Attic going? We're building up momentum. At first, when we said close Attica, people were like, yeah, uh-huh, but that's impossible, because people couldn't think beyond a certain norm, right? And then we started to unpack it for people. The prison population in New York State has declined drastically. It's dropped by more than 22,000 people over the past 15 years. And at the same time, the crime rate has dropped by 40%. So it shows that we, don't, we can have public safety and not put people in cages. Okay? So if we just want to crunch numbers, Back in 2011, Governor Cuomo closed several prisons. There were 8,000 empty beds in Doc's system at that time. With the facilities that he closed, that closed, that shut down 3,800 beds. Everybody with me on the math? So that left 4,200 still empty beds in the system. And remember, the population has continued to decline. So I'll just take a wild guess that there's at least 4,500 empty beds in the dock system right now. Okay. Attica holds at capacity less than 2,000 people. Okay. So if you were gonna do the least humanitarian thing, you could just move those 2,000, under 2,000 people to w one of those 4,500 empty beds and you could shut down Attica immediately. So that would be the, the quick and dirty fix. And so, and we're not closing our eyes to the quick and dirty fix because for some people, that's as far as they can imagine it for right now. So we would say, let's at least start with that because Attica is so symbolic. But there's Clinton, and there's Great Meadow, and there's Fishkill, and there's Sullivan, and there's Auburn, and there's Wendy, and I, the list goes on and on. And many of the atrocities that happen at Attica also happen at many of these other facilities. Clinton facility that's up in the Adirondacks, I've talked to countless people who were in Clinton decades ago, and they described to me what, the time when they decided to build a gymnasium. And so they dug up the floor, and under the floor were bones. Bones of men who had died in that facility and had just been dumped in shallow graves underneath that facility. Okay. 
And so they're continuing, yeah. people are continuing to be beaten, not within an inch of their life, but to death in these various facilities. So at the same time that we're talking about closing Attica, and we're talking about raising up the conversation about human rights abuses, we're trying to challenge people's thinking about putting people in cages. Because we know every single behavioral health research study that has been done has shown that punishment does not change behavior. But we are a society that has been fed from, from birth to believe in punishment, even though we know it doesn't work. So we continue to do that. So we're hoping to also challenge people's thinking as to how we could build a better world so that eventually we evolve from the thought that putting people in cages is acceptable. But for now, we know there's 4,500 empty beds that could shut down Attica tomorrow. Okay. A question? Yeah, I have a question in terms of the impact of private prisons on um, the uh, closing out of public prisons. So, certainly. So in New York State, they don't have private prisons. Um, there are several other states that do, but New York has done a decent job as far as pushing back against private prisons. What has happened, though, in New York is there's other privatization that is attached to prisons. So medical care is privatized, okay? The linen service is privatized. The food service is privatized, and on and on and on. So there's privatization, but the prison itself is not privatized. The operation of the prison isn't privatized. So we must always stay vigilant. When Lily was talking a little while ago about the package policy, DOCS has announced, and some of you may have heard this, that they are going to suddenly benevolently give out tablets to every person that's incarcerated. All right? How many of you have a tablet, an iPad, or something that looks like that? Okay? How much good is it to you if you couldn't access the internet with it? No good. No good at all. It would turn into a glass frisbee, right? Okay. <laughs> And that's what, that's what the tablet is, okay? Because the, the men and women inside are not gonna have internet access, okay? So, that, so what material is on that tablet is gonna be controlled by the vendor who owns it, and the data, the information about how someone uses that tablet is gonna be owned by that company, free to sell, and, and the information about how people think in using the tablet is subject to subpoena. Okay. Everybody follow those that bouncing ball? Okay. So that and so that's a there's a form of privatization with respect to that tablet that can have a very sinister um, intent. Okay. Thank you for asking that question. Other questions? Oh, can I ask um, what can be done? They keep you waiting. I went to visit, and I got there earlier than I normally would. Um, I got in the visiting room about 10.20 or 10.30. I sat, I sat, and sat, and did not go up to ask, you know, whatever, until about five minutes, or 10 minutes to 12. As I walked up, my son finally came down and I asked them, what was the problem? Because I asked what was the problem and then she uh, didn't respond, I asked to speak to the person, uh, I don't know what his um, status is, and he stayed on the phone and would not approach me to find out what I wanted. Now I waited two and some hours for the visit. And because as I was leaving, I said, God don't like ugly. What they did was they said, you would not be able to visit for a week. And then he turned and said, no, you won't be able to visit until we send you a letter. Now what can be done because that's abuse. Because I sat there two hours, this is not the first time that they have done that. Somebody in on oh, this panel want to answer that question? What do you think we could do? Um, I, I want to speak to Miss Polk. Can case. you hear me, Miss Polk? Is that a bit better? Is that a little bit better? Uh, Can you hear me a little bit better? Yes. I don't want to deafen everybody else, though. 
because if I start shouting, I wanted to say that I had a similar experience. I had gone up to visit a loved one, and when I arrived, for whatever reason, my visit was denied. Um, I probably wasn't so taken aback by the rejection or not being able to gain access, more so the treatment that I experienced from the CO when I was there. First of all, when I walked into the space, they didn't even say good morning, good afternoon. I was speaking to air. You know, I say hello, and I got nothing. And that already, after a six hour journey, which has taken its psychological toll on you, is enough to push anyone over the edge. Because you're going to see someone you love, and they are in a cage. And that's all you think about all the way there. So to get there and then be met with this hostile, yeah. cold reception yeah. does nothing for us. I took it upon myself to pull that CO to the side when nobody else was around because I didn't want it to look as though I was trying to challenge her authority or status. And I had a word with her. And I took her into the world of what it feels like to be a loved one traveling to this very moment and this place in time. I told her, no she did, Miss Beverly, after speaking with her, I told her that something as simple as a smile can make the world of difference to all of us. Acknowledging our presence and our existence means the world to us. Because we are criminalized from the moment we walk into that space anyway. I'm told to take my bra off, I have to take this off, make sure I haven't got this hidden, do drug tests, da da da. Last time I checked, I hadn't done anything wrong. When I spoke to that CEO, she was not happy, she was not happy. But something happened and she shifted. And it's because I connected with her on some sort of a personal level. She broke down and she started telling me about the stress that she has to go through with having to process numbers of people within a certain space of time and the pressure that she's getting from up here and how that affects her. So my conversational question to her was, how are we coming from two different positions going to fix this moving forward, because this can't continue. And from that point forth, she agreed, she would smile, she would say hello, and I know it didn't make a difference in terms of me gaining access, but one thing I will say is it makes a difference to other people walking into that space. So that's just my, that's how I deal from on an interpersonal level. I want to have conversations with people, but I know you're going into something a lot deeper about the abuse of restricting someone from seeing their loved one. And what we can do collectively, what we can I do. Can see if it was once that they did. Now, I understand. So what, and we are tr attempting to push back on systemic abuses. So one of the things we can do, we can write to the superintendent. The organization can write to the superintendent. We can send love letters to the governor. We know he likes to get love letters. All right. I can call the commissioner. He always knows if I call him, it's not going to put a smile on his face. Okay. So. There are various ways that we can use our collective efforts, all right? And that's why it's so important that we raise these issues so that more and more people know, so that more and more people can add their voices to this effort. So thank you for asking that question. I think someone else had a, their hand up a moment ago. I, yes. Yeah, um, I, I wonder just, you know, the, the, the problems here are just amazing, and it seems like a lot of what you're doing is raising awareness. It's like educated. People know about what you just described. It's horrible, and so people do more. But that's one thing, but it also sounds like there's this whole, there's a lot of people in favor of prisons. They make money on it, it's an employer. You mentioned the packages. There are vendors who make, make, make money on that. Um, so I just wonder, what, how, how do you attack both of these issues? And what is the resistance you would face from that sort of more that, the economics of it? First of all, that, that's a great question also, uh, Mark. Thank you for asking it. So you heard us say earlier that we form partnerships with organizations throughout upstate New York. Almost all of the 54 prisons in New York State are located in upstate communities. And in most of those communities, they are the, the centerpiece of an economic um, life, life raft, really. Okay? So what we are looking at is the fact that for many of those communities, the young people who are coming up have no other place to turn for a job except 
to go work in a prison. Okay? And so part of our effort in building relationships in upstate communities is to build a conversation about how those communities could join us in advocating for a different form of economic support. Okay? They, there's, just like when, when a company decides it's gonna go offshore, it's leaving the United States and go someplace else, it sets up an industry in another area where they feel they're gonna get cheap labor. Okay? So it is possible to build new industries in these communities if there was the will to do it. And part of the way to create the will to do it is to help empower people <laughs> to elevate that conversation and to help them understand that the, the dinner on their table is at the expense of another family that's suffering in Bed-Stuy, East New York, Brownsville, Harlem, South Jamaica, and on and on. Because for many of them, there's a, you know, we all know there's this upstate, downstate divide. And that was another reason that the March for Justice was so important, is that we could start to break that down. And so people to people relationships is how you reach hearts and minds. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you. And, and we came in late, so apologies if this has already been addressed. Um, so in terms of the work that you all do, um, you hear you mentioned uh, interacting directly with the CEO, CEO who you had um, taken issue with. Um, and uh, you talk about um, you know, CEOs coming to work, cheap labor, and things like that in your last comment. Uh, what type of work do you all do you know, to reach out to the people who are working in the prisons to attempt to change hearts and minds? And so in terms of as like a long-term strategy, like the prison to be shut down, but in terms of, okay, here we are, what do we need to do to make the process better for the people who are having to live in these prisons by working with the people who are working at these prisons? So first of all, I'm glad you asked that question because a lot of times people do ask us. Um, our, organ our organization is called the Alliance of Families for Justice intentionally. And our first concern is the families whose lives have been destroyed because they have loved ones who are incarcerated. Okay? That, that has to be where we start. Okay? Our sister Carol here, her son is incarcerated and it was wrecking her life. Okay? All the families who come to us, come to us traumatized. And their loved ones inside are terrorized by the people who get a paycheck from the state of New York. Okay? So we have to start with the people who are traumatized. Okay? We intentionally partner upstate New York because we know most of the guards live in the regions where our upstate partners are. And so it is our upstate partners who help us build and craft what the dialogue will be to reach some of their neighbors, okay? But our first concern is the families that are being destroyed, okay? But we are clear that ultimately, the way that we're going to take this beast down, and I do call it a beast, is that we will have to build bridges with the people who are employed in those facilities and the people who are incarcerated in those facilities. But we also have to get the people who are employed in those facilities to recognize the humanity of the people who are incarcerated in those facilities. And so the awareness that we're focused on building right now is on that. Okay. okay. Yes, question. Yeah, I have a question. Because like, when I did 10 years in prison, and when, like, when you mentioned speaking to the officer at the visit, or like, taking collective action against the system. Oftentimes, when a letter is sent to Albany or... Thank you. When a letter is sent to Albany or any action is taken, as an inmate, funny things start happening. Hi, they call you to the ID room, you get smacked up, punched in the face, made off to sign off on things to say you didn't do anything. There's a lot of physical violence and coercion that, that takes place. So what are some of like, the action plans that we have in place to ensure that like, the individual inside and safe? Like, do we have things in place to like periodically check up on them and whatnot? 
Yes, we. Who wants to do that? Yes. Look, other Carol, go first, and then I'll. Speak. Yes. On, on, on my son, he was getting a lot of retaliation because we was doing a lot of back and forth. You know, like you said, they take you out, they beat you, they gas you for no reason because you're, you're, he's been aware that he's sending letters to Albany, sending letters to the court. And when Alliance of Family got you know, involved, they kind of backed off because they realized it's not just he's writing and I'm writing, but there's a, a group of people that's taking notice Sophia, it's been uh, five years, he has some uh, problem with his throat and stuff like that. Sophia got in touch with the commissioner and they start giving the medication that he needs. Okay, so the Alliance, Alliance of Family for Justice is doing what they're doing. But we also have to get our loved ones in there to write and let them know, you know, what's happening to them. Because if we don't know, we can't help. Okay, so the retaliation will go on but is, uh, and he, and he, this, he's still been getting retaliated against, but is it important enough to get a little slapping so 10 other people don't get that slapping? You understand what I'm saying? Which is not right in any form at all, it's not right. So you'll be beaten, but sometimes you have to take that retaliation so you can take notice, so they can be noticed and other people can be aware of what's going on. So as for Sophie and her, and her Alliance of Family for Justice, they are, intertwining with the family members and the people inside there. I don't know if I answered you correctly about the retaliation, but right now they, uh, they do do that. And the family member, I think, they would rather get a little retaliation and get notice than just it still keep going on and on and on. Thank you, Carol. The other thing that we do, Angel, is when we can, we reach out, I usually reach out to the commissioner, and I don't use the name. I don't use the name or the DIN number. I say, there's a situation happening in this facility. Okay. It happened in this month. Okay. Need you to look into it. I don't give the date. I don't give any DIN number. Okay. I don't give the age of the person. All right. So that it's not easy to identify who it is that brought it to our attention. But I let the commissioner know that we're watching and he knows we're not at a loss to make a noise. If we had enough nerve to walk to Albany, we sure don't have a problem calling him out. Okay? And so that is how we try to protect against retaliation. And we make it clear to our family members that we need to know from the person inside if they want us to use their name. Because we will never use their name unless they say, absolutely, we want you to do so. And I ask them to tell us in writing. Because I know. I'm not there on the 3 to 11 shift when all the mischief happens and people are beaten and killed. Right? Excuse me. And we also have uh, some family members up in, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess this word up completely. But I'm, and, oh, you got it? Anirondacks? We also have family members up there that, you know, if anything happens and they're so close, they'll go and check up on them for us because that will happen to me. Uh, lovely Martha, she went to the prison because they beat my son and I didn't hear from him for about two weeks and I was very scared. So we contacted one of the members that's upstate. They went up there about an hour and a half away. They was able to go up there, make sure he's okay. Also, they, they, what they do is that if you reject, you know, they reject you from seeing your loved one, they come and pick you up and take you off of the internet. They're six, sitting, sitting there six hours to wait for the bus to come back. They will take you up and take you around and, you know, and treat you. They also bring you cookies and hand warmers and you know toasty toasties so you know this is not just us it's open up all the way upstate and there's people doing work up there also yes question yeah. it's a question and a positive who has the microphone i don't know where it is oh. Oh, here we go. i'd like you to comment more on um the groups that support you sometimes in terms of advocacy or face groups. So there are people who may not be in the trenches emotionally, but because we all are human beings, we all know that this is wrong and this is our tax dollars. Can you comment? Because there are a lot of groups, you know, yes. that you give advocacy and it's not personal, but yes. there are there are a whole 
network of, of churches and organizations that stepped up when we did the March for Justice and who also supported us with the package policy effort with, the, with respect to getting the postcards sent in. We mailed them out throughout um, the this, this state and people readily um, got the members of their congregation to sign them. We, when we stayed in Kingston, we stayed in the LGBTQ Center. They um, took postcards and so got them signed. Every minister that we connected with took postcards and got them signed. And they, they have pledged to stay in contact with us and always ask us to keep them informed about what are the issues we're working on. Um, because they don't, not everybody has to be um, walking 180 miles or um, coming to our monthly meetings but in whatever way people can assist, they do. We have people who intern with us. There's a one woman who's helped us. She lives in North Carolina. We've never met her in person. Um, we have students who come and spend um, three weeks with us or spring break. One young lady came up from Florida. She's a law student down there, and she spent one week with us interning because she was, um, it mattered to her the kind of work we were doing because she has a cousin who's incarcerated. Um, another young lady, she was getting her PhD at Yale, and she came and spent the summer with us. Um, we have some volunteers who are retired um, who come and spend um, time with us. There's a gentleman who's, who works up in Westchester. He comes down on Fridays and spends six, four hours um, volunteering his time. So there's so many different ways that people support our work. The, most of the materials that you see um, the graphic designer is a young woman who learned about us through a friend of hers. She doesn't have the time to come to our meetings, but she designs anything that we need designed. The palm card about the regional conference, um, the, our brochure, our annual report. She's, she's, she's in business for herself. She came and did outreach at night. That's the person that Carol was referencing, gave her um, material about um, what we do. And I will readily admit, when she first saw the kind of materials that we had designed kind of makeshift, she was mortified. Okay? <laughs> she was like, oh my God, this is like, this is like really embarrassing. I gotta, <laughs> gotta help these people. And she took us from looking ragtag to looking professional. Right? And so there's, there's a way for everybody who wants to help, to help. Thank you for asking that question, Roberta. I don't know where we are time-wise. It's 20 to 4. Are there any other questions? Could you please join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists? Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, everyone.